Uh, I think it, uh, it seems like most of us are, are back in the auditorium, and I think we'll uh, uh, be best off uh, proceeding to the next lecture. Uh, as, as I said earlier, we've been a bit squeezed by Tobias's excellent lecture. Um, but uh, before, we talked about uh, the needs um, of, um, of the different uh, customers. Uh, next, we'll be talking about two things, the value proposition and the market. The value proposition is essentially one of these terms you need to be aware of, because that's a term they use a lot at CBS and places like that. It's essentially about, the, the whole thing about value proposition is that you need to be able to communicate what is the value of your product uh, in terms of the needs of the customers. So it's essentially just a, a, a term that entails uh, how can we in an efficient way communicate uh, how our product meets the needs of the customers. Um, so you see a lot of, uh, it's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a science, this whole thing with value propositions and, and uh, what you, uh, what you uh, tend to find out that, um, is that uh, despite there being a lot of ideas, it tends to contain the same, and I'll get back to that in a second. Um, you'll also see that uh, it's, it's nice that you have a basis, so a few sentences, a short sentence that actually describes your product. Of course, you wouldn't, wouldn't as I just said, you have different needs for different parts of uh, organizations, different actors over time, they also change. So the value proposition is also bind, bound to change, but the ideal situation is one in which you have a somewhat consistent value proposition and you ch change it slightly compared to, well, uh, in just uh, in, for each case, for each customer, so that it meets the particular needs of that customer. And I'll get into the specifics of that in, in one second. Um, what you see is that there are a lot of recipes for, for doing a, a value proposition. And uh, what I'll do is essentially give you the one I tend to use. And uh, please, uh, please remember the fact that this value proposition is about understanding how your product links to the need of the customer. It's, not so, it's, it's something that you should use to communicate the value of your product, and it's also something that you should use yourself to understand what is the entirety of the value of your product. So it's not necessarily a very advanced tool, but it's something that uh, helps you communicate, it's something that helps you understand the value. And this is one from uh, crossing the chasm, a, a framework, a business framework, uh, that I tend to use. What you do is that you say, for this particular customer that you've identified, um, uh, who tends to need these specific we just talked about the needs in the last uh, part of the lecture, um, our product is a solution for that particular need. And in this case, uh, again, it's about communication. You need to communicate in the language of the customer. Um, <clears throat> that, well, of course, helps that. Uh, and unlike key competitors, who are your competitors, uh, ours, our product does something different. So, of course, also you ha you'll have to be very much aware of how your product does something different from other products in the similar, uh, in, that could be uh, competing products. Um, and also, of course, the price is always uh, an important issue. So, uh, just to, um, to get you to understand how this works, uh, for a specific case, I've, uh, I've tried to, tried to uh, do it for my, my own company. <clears throat> Essentially, what you should end up with is uh, something that's two or three lines, something that's really easy to communicate, something that you have in, your back, in the back of your head uh, so that whenever something, someone asks you uh, what, it is, what it is you provide, you say this. So, if, uh, just a short recap. If, uh, I, I'm not sure that uh, all of you remember, but uh, my company, the one I'm a co-founder of, uh, does wind turbines for, uh, for industrial estates, big box-shaped buildings that are in the outskirts of cities and uh, in airports, things like that. Um, and of course, we've also been working on our value proposition. And I wanted to show you a little bit about that because <clears throat> this is done by my colleague, actually. <coughs> and I think it, uh, it definitely, uh, uh, I, I thought I changed that. 
I didn't. <laughs> well, there's, a, there's, a, there's an error on this, uh, this slide, but uh, whatever. Um, what I've done is essentially used the recipe from before and formulated a sentence. It would be very nice if you did the same. It would be very good for you to go through the same process of doing a big, bulky sentence with all of it in there, and then afterwards, uh, you try to condense that into something more concise, something more specific, and again, maybe something even more concise and more specific. It's a very good pro process, and it'll enable you to end up with something that could be communicated very quickly. And what we ended up with uh, is, is uh, the bottom part there. For customers working toward a more sustainable business, edge flows wind turbines constitute a ne the next pragmatic investment as well, as well as a visionary blueprint for pervasive change. So that's all very fluffy, isn't it? But it's, uh, it's something that uh, an investor likes to hear, and it has a lot of the buzzwords that the strategic level of a company wants, a lot of the buzzwords that the environmental department of a company wants, and also um, uh, the investment stuff uh, relates, of course, to procurement and to the financial department. So it has uh, a lot of addresses in there. So just to give you a spatial insight into how this value proposition is, is, uh, is uh, done, well, of course, we have a wind turbine, but that's not really the value of our product. So that's just the, the core of our product. Uh, what we do provide is several, I need this one here. We have several services around the core of the product, the link to the product. And let's say, for instance, we have something up here called financing options. Uh, that's about how can you actually finance buying this wind turbine. So do we have a leasing agreement? Do we sell it up front? Do we have loans? Things like that that we can help the customer with. That's something that, uh, something that the financial department would be very interested in, in uh, knowing about. Down here we have some PR material, internal and external, meaning that we have PR material for the employees of the company that is buying or uh, investing into the turbine. And we also have PR material that they can use, for instance, for their outward communications. Um, down here we have some value chain integration. Uh, for the strategic management, it's very important that these different messages, the, this, uh, this PR, is linked very much to the core of their business. So for instance, if you have a wind turbine that's on top of the production facility that produces the furniture for IKEA, it's a very clear coupling, and it, it couples very directly to where the energy is used and where they have their big uh, environmental footprint. So think about that. Think about how you can make your product or your offering into different components and how those different components uh, relate to uh, different customers and different organizational levels. So uh, that was a bit about market, pr uh, sorry, the value proposition. Let's go on to the market, which is, of course, a hugely important part of uh, what we're looking at uh, today. Um, so, uh, sorry. <laughs> What, uh, what is the market? Well, f a market can be described in, in several different terms. And, and in some cases, you have like a social impact of a product. And it's not necessarily the, the financial stuff that adds in there. But uh, a typical uh, notion of a market is a place where the value of your product can be realized. So where the product actually meets the customer. Um, the market is also, in, in, especially for, for you know, new markets, a place where you can uh, find an opportunity to establish a business. And uh, there's a sort of a co-play here because your product can be defined by a market or a segment, but on the other hand, it's the, it tends to be the other way around that you have an idea and this idea sort of defines where should we go? Who's, who is this idea relevant to? So there's an interplay there. You have to think both ways. Um, it's very complex. You'll never find something. I, one of my working titles of the, on these slides were uh, no uh, exact science uh, for the next 100 slides or something like that. I don't think it's 100 slides. But market investigation and market description is an inherently complex and difficult task. And it's about being creative. I'll get back to that. Um, <clears throat> a 
of course, you'll have to know these uh, complexities for it to work. Typically, you would give, you would uh, define the market size as something like number of sales, the turnover, i.e., the number of sales times the sales price. It could also be the gross margin, which is uh, well the number of sales times the uh, sales price. Of course, taking into account also the cost of the product, so the profit essentially, um, and other things that you tend to see in market analysis and things like that is uh, these. Uh, these terms here, earnings before interest and tax, or earnest, earnings before interest and tax and depreciation and amortization. Let's forget, for, for, forget about those for, for the time being. They're not that important to you, and they're a little bit uh, too CBS for us, I think. So dimensions of the market. The market tends to uh, um, uh, have a structure to it. At least you can try to introduce some kind of a structure to it. Um, and uh, a lot of the work we'll be doing this, uh, in this lecture is actually on uh, establishing a structure for the market. Um, and uh, establishing a structure essentially starts out by uh, trying to pinpoint some of the dimensions of the market. You could have a dimension like, is it local? Is it global? Is it uh, large companies? Is it small companies? For the Xerox case that Thomas mentioned uh, at an earlier point, is it uh, 10 copies per day or is it 10,000 copies per day? Those are dimensions of uh, the same, sorry, those are different um, sizes of the same dimension and you can use those to, uh, to uh, structure your market. Um, and it's also uh, very interesting and actually that relates a little bit to what Tobias says. It's, it's very interesting to try to define the perfect customer. For instance, uh, I'll get back to some, uh, some examples in a second, but uh, uh, let's say we have, uh, um, what's, a good, uh, what's a good example? A car company, the perfect, uh, the perfect cust customer uh, buys a car uh, every year. Um, he pays a lot for the car, it doesn't have to be very good quality, um, so we can earn a lot per sale. Uh, and he has uh, very low uh, requirements for uh, you know, the general functionality of the car. Seems like a, a good customer to sell to, doesn't it? So you could set up cases like that and be aware of what are these characteristics I'm trying to uh, describe this customer with and use those characteristics for describing other customers. And I'll get back to that in a second. So this is uh, the case that we'll be using for the rest of the day. Company X wants to sell non-alcoholic beer. Uh, so I think this is a bit of a stretch for DTU students in general, but uh, I think that's uh, what makes it interesting. And um, what we need to figure out is um, what would be the perfect customer, the characteristics of a perfect customer for this, for this company. And uh, you'll try to, you'll, uh, we'll see if you can give me some inputs on this. And just to help you along, let's just uh, see a few of those. It would be nice if this uh, customer drinks large quantities of beer, beer wouldn't it? Also, it, uh, it would be good if uh, this customer cannot for some reason or may not drink uh, alcohol. Um, and also, just from a you know, business perspective, it would, be, it would be nice if they were part of a defined group. So, what else can we think about? Any inputs? Yeah? Have a lot of capsule. That's a good. Uh, that's a good input. Uh, I won't be able to write it down, but uh, please uh, remember uh, ideas like that. Any other inputs? Uh, price of the product. So is that the customer is willing to pay a high price for the product? Is that what you're saying? No, it should be cheap, so the customer would buy the product. Yeah, but this this is in this case we're looking at the customer in particular. So what what uh, what would be not, what be, would be a nice characteristic for the customer? So I would turn that around and say we would like a customer that is willing to pay a lot for the for the product. In the middle. Has a nice taste, like a beer with alcohol. Has a similar taste. Oh, the beer. Is, okay, but if we have to uh, we have to look away from the product itself. So, uh, but uh, but uh, <coughs> to be cynical about that, I would say it would be nice. I don't know if it's possible to make non-alcoholic beer that tastes like normal beer. But then we would, uh, it would be nice to say that, okay, has, uh, you know, little regard for, uh, you know, sorry, 
uh, is willing to accept changes in taste or something like that, that could be a good outset. Yeah? Um, does not matter if, the, if it's... Uh, would like the same bottle so that we can use the same bottle for both this and the other one. So he's not uh, curious about the design of the product. Okay, yeah. So it has a, has a, uh, an allegiance or a tradition of uh, using that particular bottle and is inclined to use that bottle or uh, use beverages in that bottle. Yeah. Cool. Last one. It's a role model, so you can persuade others to buy it. Yeah. That's, uh, that's sort of, uh, then we get into the sort of derivative <laughs> business because um, if we have a, if we can get that person uh, on, then uh, we actually open up for more sales. So that's a very good point. Um, <clears throat> but let's... Um, yeah, I might just add a, a quick anecdote on that uh, last mm -hmm. point. Um, when I was working in the packaging industry, uh, they came up with a, a new packaging which had a, uh, basically a can with a foil peel wrap on the top. Um, and it was a really good new technology for, uh, for the company. But unfortunately, their first sales were to pet food. Um, and they made, you know, pet food's a huge market. But unfortunately, it wasn't a particularly desirable customer to influence other customers because they associated that particular product then with pet food forevermore. So you can't really say it, sell high brand goods in that tin anymore because customers see it and think pet food. <laughs> so maybe if this is uh, uh, sold to um, tramps or recovering alcoholics, maybe it hasn't quite got the right brand image for uh, selling sure. to uh, uh, youths or people wanting to uh, drive home from a pub after a night out. That's so a very good, that's point. A good point. Thanks a lot for that, Tom. So uh, what will happen throughout this lecture is that I'll write this at the bottom of uh, this at the bottom of uh, the exercises because uh, what I think you should do on Friday or before Friday, whenever you meet up next, uh, look into these things. Try to describe your own customer for your own product uh, in terms of uh, favorable characteristics and do the rest of the exercises in, uh, in this uh, presentation as well. So moving on. Um, market, market segmentation, I've had a discussion about this with, with several of you uh, along the way, but now we've established that we could describe a market by some di dimensions, and these dimensions could be these favorable characteristics. So <coughs> what you can do is essentially um, uh, try to simplify your problem, or let's say simplify your market by putting it into segments. and. Um, what, uh, what you could do is say, okay, let's say I try to describe uh, these, um, uh, this market here using two dimensions. One is a country. It, if to uh, link that to a favorable characteristic, it could be a proximity to company address, something like that. Uh, the other one could be a company size. Linking that to a favorable characteristic, one could say, okay, number of sales, sorry, number of uh, bottles sold per sale uh, if we took the, the beer case. Um, and by doing that, you can actually start thinking, okay, so we're in Denmark and uh, we don't have a big sales organization. So maybe we should think about a segment, let's say segment one, large Danish companies because they're close by and each time we sell, we sell to, well, the whole company so they can potentially, let's say, buy a lot of beer. Um, also, Germany is quite close, and actually it turns out that in Germany they have subsidies for medium-sized businesses. So uh, buying beer is actually something that's supported by the state, so that could be another segment. Uh, my point here is that you can use these dimensions to try to uh, delimit different segments of your market. Um, so let's just uh, try to do that again for, for the beer case, the non-alcoholic beer case. Um, could you come up with some, uh, some customer segments? I think actually Tom already gave us one, hobos and uh, alcoholics, <laughs> Re recovering alcoholics. So that's the segment, not necessarily the, where we sh the one we should start in, but uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Pregnant woman. Who Pregnant woman, that's a good point. There was one up here. Drivers. Drivers, that's a good point, yeah. Drivers. Yep, good one. Please. Expats in uh, countries where alcohol is illegal. Yes. Yep. Ch children, yeah. 
<laughs> this reminds me of the movie Thank You for Smoking. <laughs> there's, a, there's a segment for everything, isn't there? <laughs> Not necessarily one wants to venture into, but can, you know. Yeah. Can I just add there, one of the things you didn't mention on the last slide was uh, brand loyalty. You like customers with a lot of brand loyalty. So maybe selling it to children or under eight is not that bad a thing. If they've got a lot of brand loyalty, uh, they may be brand loyal to Tuborg now. Yeah. And I know the makeup and cosmetic industry really thrive on that. They try to get young, impressionable teenage girls to lock into a brand because quite often a teenage girl who selects a brand of makeup or foundation sticks with it for life. Um, so customers with brand loyalty is a, uh, a really good thing to get hold of. Thanks for that. So uh, very good inputs. I think uh, I, I put some, uh, some of them up here as well. The elderly could be, they still want to drink beer, but uh, they don't have uh, uh, the same tolerance as, as they used to. Uh, well, you said uh, drivers. So I think that's actually a better uh, input than, than what I'm putting up here. Someone uh, wants to drink a beer at a pub, but they need to drive home. But uh, it could also be drivers in general. So there's, you know, there was, that could, this should be a sub-segment of what you're proposing. So, uh, and also I think I had one more. No, I didn't. <laughs> but I think uh, you, you covered the basis pretty well. Um, so what you're say, seeing here is that you're definitely able to point out some groups of people, groups of customers that could be segments. And having, points, having pointed them out, enables you to reduce the complexity. So going into a, each one of these segments would be easier than going into the whole market at once because you would have very varying and very different needs. Again, do the same for your own idea. Not today, but uh, before Friday or on Friday. Um, the next part is uh, choosing a place to start because uh, uh, as I just said, you can't do it all at once or at, from, from day one. So what you need is find a really easy and accessible segment. Uh, and there's this analogy of the pins of the bowl, on the bowling alley. Imagine when you're throwing the bowling ball down the bowling alley, what you need to do is hit the first pin and that'll take down the rest of the pins. So the logic is that as, as you hit the first pin, it, um, you have the... Um, that's what, here, that, that's what I write down here. You have a basis for going into the next set, segment and taking down the next pin. So what does a basis mean? That means that you have the money in place. You've earned your first uh, buck. You have your production in place. You know one customer. You have your bread and butter, as they say, and then you can proceed into to new segments and, and build, your, uh, build your business. So, what I propose uh, you do when you want to evaluate these segments, where should we start out, is that you take these favorable characteristics that we listed before, do them for your product, and then you say, how does this segment comply to that favorable characteristic? Um, and just to clarify that, I'll get back to my own company and uh, show you how I did uh, that exact same thing. Um, because what you need to do is, um, well, here on top, I've listed a lot of different, uh, different favorable characteristics. So for a wind turbine of my type, uh, the one I'm providing, you need something that has, well, initially at least, strong subsidies. That's always good because that, that means that the, the, energy of the, value, the value of the energy I'm producing is very high. We need a tall building because the whole idea with my wind turbine is, as, is that as the wind hits the building, it accelerates. And the taller the building, this acceleration, uh, you know, the taller the building, the more acceleration and the more energy. So that's another favorable characteristic. And you can read them uh, throughout here. Uh, another thing is, that's good is, for instance, high number of wind turbines per facility and also High, large number of facilities per sale. So let's say, for instance, I'm selling to uh, IKEA or Tesco or something like that, someone like that. Each time I sell once to IKEA, I have the opportunity to sell to, let's say, 10 warehouses instead of you know, going from door to door and selling to this guy, this guy, this guy, and maybe only selling one wind turbine each time. So this relates to the sales strategy, and that's something I'll get back to in the third lecture. So what I've done is essentially just done a, I've done my different segments out here, and then I've done a very quick compliance measure 
uh, ranging from poor to good compliance with the favorable characteristic. And by doing that, I've rated all the segments that I've listed. There are some of them that are a little bit secret, so I won't share them, uh, them with you. So they've been just uh, named C8 through uh, 14. And this enables me to actually find out where should I start. And incidentally, this is also a prioritized list. So uh, in this case, the first one, the high bay warehouses is actually the one we'll be starting with. So I'd like to ask you at this point, is something, isn't something missing here when you look at the favorable characteristics up here? No input? Well, it's just, you know, it's not necessarily an easy question because uh, <laughs> what about the market size? I haven't actually rated these different segments with regard to uh, market size, and there's a reason for that. Of course, market size is hugely important. Uh, but at this point, I'm looking to find out where should I start, where should I sell my first wind turbines. I don't have any track record. No one knows my wind turbines. So I need to get some of them up there spinning, and I need some place where it just is, is uh, sure to work so that I can you know, go into other segments, you know, the bowling alley strategy. So at this point, the market size isn't all that important. What's important is actually getting references the important thing is getting references, getting other people uh, familiar with the product, and then I can do the big push into a large market segment. So of course it would be very nice if I could do both. Uh, my, my point here is just, well, of course by both I mean find an easy segment that's actually also a big market, um, a big, uh, of, sorry, of big size, but, uh, but uh, in this case it's not necessarily the case in the, the situation. So uh, I don't think we can do this uh, next exercise uh, up here, but uh, maybe we should do one of the segments uh, and say, OK, what favorable characteristics did we come up with? Let's say uh, we had, um, didn't someone say factory workers or something like that? Construction side. Construction side workers, yeah. And we had some, some, some different uh, characteristics in there. Uh, we had. Uh, Sorry, you could uh, some of the characteristics. Could you mention some of them? I have some of them in my head, but I'm not sure that I had the best ones. <laughs> okay, but we have, for instance, uh, uh, the you know tendency to buy uh, beer or to like beer. I think uh, that would probably be a high rating. That's in good compliance with that. The next one is uh, well, uh, the lack of uh, sorry the. The lack of um, basis, or sorry, what's it called? They're not allowed to drink beer, or may not drink beer. Uh, that's the next. That was the next favorable characteristic. Knowing construction sites these days, maybe when, if we went back five or ten years, uh, this would not be a problem. But today, I would say that that segment definitely complies very well with that characteristic. So that's actually also a, a hidden opportunity because. Uh, I actually know, for instance, uh, maybe you know Amarwerk, which is like a garbage disposal incineration uh, plant on, um, on Amar. What they've done there is that they've switched out all, there used to be like uh, little nooks in the walls where they could have a beer case standing. So the workers would go there, you know, a lot of times during the day and they'd always, always grab a beer and just have a chat. Uh, and I think maybe it's only like six or seven years ago that kind of went out the door because it wasn't really, uh, you know, it wasn't really safe to have people drinking at work. I think it's still allowed at Carlsberg, though. So what did they do instead? They put out water, <laughs> cases of water, and I don't know if I'm if I were a factory worker, I'd be, you know, I wouldn't be entirely pleased with the fact that uh, my beer had just been replaced by water. Um, but uh, that's just a, you know, a case showing that there's an opportunity hidden in, in looking into that segment. Of course, you can do the same for the rest of the favorable characteristics, trying to list them. It's not something that will give you a, you know, a perfect and a, a safe answer, but it's something that will give you an idea of how complex is this, how easy is it going to be to go into this particular segment. Again, do this for your own products. Um, so estimating market sizes, it's something I haven't looked too much into at this point, but uh, I think uh, we should definitely put some, some words on that because this is actually uh, something that uh, the investor is bound to listen to very 
uh, closely, and it's also something that you should be very much aware of. Um, there are a lot of different um, uh, types of uh, market info. First of all, this point is important. It's, it's pretty much important, uh, impossible to actually pinpoint a market size. No one knows what size the market is, not even you know, the big ones. The Novo Nordisks and the Tesco's and things like that, they don't know. They have a good idea because they have a sales record, but they don't have an absolute figure that shows the market. Of course, there are some exceptions. Moon rockets haven't been sold in that great numbers, so uh, we know how many, what the market is for those. At least back when they started making them, they had a, probably had a pretty good agreement with uh, NASA for, uh, for building them. Um, and also, uh, you know, like ubiquitous products that everyone needs, for instance, air for breathing. That's, uh, that's also pretty easy to establish a market for. But uh, aside from that, you know, don't try to get an absolute figure for the market. It's a case of, is it 10,000 units sold or is it 10 million units sold? It's sort of, a, um, it's a question of scale. It's not a question of the exact figure. Um, investors want these big figures. So if you can say that this submarket here uh, as a part of the entire market is actually in itself interesting and you can actually say that but we know that the market is bigger than that then the investor is uh, you know is online and interested in proceeding with uh, with your case so market data how do we handle that well uh, it's hard to come across and um, you have some good and bad types of market data um, Let's say the bad type, and this is a very general uh, observation, but a bad type would be something where you would afterwards have to qualify it to find out your actual market size. Because this whole idea of qualification is, is kind of hard. Um, for instance, let's say we have from a certain number from the statistics, but we know that maybe it's only a part of that number who's actually you know, real customers to our product. How do you get from the first number to the second number? And that qualification uh, process is kind of hard. And you should always, when you do a qualification like that, you should always write down the basis for your qualification. Uh, having said that, that's what, the, you know, that's what everyone else is doing. <laughs> so it's completely legitimate to write down your qualifications and say, uh, we based this market size on these assumptions. Of course, it would be much better, and this is what I uh, suggest that you do, to look into sub-markets, parts of the market that are delimited somehow and that you know are within the market, uh, that tends to, you know, that tends to uh, be available. Um, it may not be a very big sub-part, but you, if you can find a few sub-parts and show that it's big enough, then that's a good basis for going into a business. So the general, the, the general idea is that it's better to say it's at least as big as than uh, no bigger than. So the next part here is about uh, how to estimate different types of, uh, how to estimate uh, the market for, uh, for, different, um, for different areas. And, and here you have like a top-down approach and you have a bottom-up approach. And also at the end of this, I'll try to link it to what I've done. Uh, and I'll show you that this is just a case of figuring it out and uh, trying to, you know, make it work and trying to set up the assumptions that you need. And, well, the bottom-up approach, of course, is about you just starting somewhere and essentially going door-to-door. -door. So it could be you going on, uh, you know, the yellow pages, just trying to figure out, okay, can we find some companies that seem interested here, interesting here, or going on Facebook and seeing how many are interested in this type of movie, and in, by doing that, uh, trying to figure out, okay, this next movie I'm going to make will have a market that's this size. So that's the bottom-up approach. Um, and also in this case, it's always good to, to look for users in, in fora. Uh, they tend to uh, establish their own, uh, you know, meeting places and foras, uh, fora is, uh, uh, is one place where you can actually find the users and maybe even uh, look at how many members do these fora have and, and could you pinpoint specific members from reading the pages. And also in this, uh, in this instance, the surveys are very important. So uh, do surveys and see who could be interested. 
In this case, I think Kickstarter is absolutely brilliant because Kickstarter, what is Kickstarter? It's a uh, market validation. It's a, uh, you know, you get specific customers each time uh, someone funds you. So it's a uh, market validation. You already know how many customers you have and you already have the money for, from these customers. So uh, I would always recommend a Kickstarter project for, for an, a bottom-up approach or in many other cases as well. The other one, of course, is uh, the top-down approach. And uh, for instance, for mature markets, we talked about that in, uh, in the last lecture, for mature markets, you tend to have big blocks of info that the market for diabetes medicine in North America is this large. Stuff like that is really, uh, really nice, but uh, you know, it's, not, it's pretty rare as well. You, you tend to, uh, uh, it's not that often that you actually see market intelligence like that. So what you'll do is uh, instead go into statistics, read articles, they tend also to have some, uh, some figures, uh, market analysis in, in general, and, and also other references. Uh, who else is in this business or in uh, related businesses? For instance, if I'm doing a web service or a web product, who else is selling to someone who could be my customer, and how much are they selling? So the next part here is, <laughs> is, is very important to remember. If you, for instance, do a survey, and you have your product sold, and everyone says, this looks really interested, interesting, I would be interested in buying this. That's all very well and good, but the fact is just that going from interest to actual sales, you lose a lot of leads. So uh, your market size has to be able to endure the fact that maybe only 15% or 10% or 8% or 6% of this total market will actually buy your product. So that's something that you have to remember as well. So, Back to Edgeflow, and this is just to show you that I've raised, I've raised uh, capital in, in, on several occasions using this stuff I'm about to show you, so uh, I hope that'll uh, sort of uh, keep you a little bit um, more confident with uh, what you're about to face because uh, you'll see it's, uh, it's, not very, uh, it's not very advanced. This is uh, one of my market estimates. What I did is I looked into the Danish statistics, found out how many buildings are there of a certain size. That's something that's in the statistics. Of course, uh, those buildings weren't all interesting for my product because it's a wind turbine, so you can have buildings blocking each other, you can have buildings facing the wrong direction, and you can have buildings of, you know, that aren't of, of proper height. So I had to essentially go on Google Maps, point out different uh, industrial areas, and look at, okay, of these buildings that are larger than, let's say, 2,000 square meters, how many of those are actually interesting how many, from a technical standpoint? Can you actually read this? Is it, uh, is it readable? Yes. Okay, that's good. Um, and what I did, did then was, uh, I, well, those, those are covered by this, and I also tried to look into how many wind turbines can actually fit on these buildings, because that's the next uh, very important uh, parameter. And then, I did a, a big survey uh, of uh, where I had phone calls with uh, 30 uh, candidate companies, and I tried to figure out how many of these companies are actually interested in my product. And then, lastly, I sort of did some uh, took into account some general knowledge on uh, how much. Uh, so, what is the hit rate per you know first lead for selling a product like this? To, uh, of this, uh, uh, this complexity and this, uh, this size and this price. And what I ended up with was uh, you know, a potential for, of uh, turbines sold in the DK. That's one estimate. The next estimate was about, well, door to door essentially. This is something yep. my, sorry? Sorry, uh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. What are you doing there, multiplying them to get the uh, Yeah, potential? okay, so I should have communicated that a bit better. So what I have is, is, a, is an initial figure here, and this, is, this would be a factor. Uh, so uh, after this, I have, okay, sorry, initial figures, this is number of buildings. This, the size of this should be number of turbines per building. The size of this should be a share, share of, uh, you know, um, acceptable buildings. Uh, this would be share of interested customers from my survey. And lastly, you have a number of actual uh, turbines sold. So that's, that's progress the progression there. I see now that that's not communicated very clearly, so I apologize for that. Um, but that's the general idea. I'll try to get the units on for the next one here. 
Because what we did here was essentially we went to UK, the UK on Google Earth, uh, and we started looking through industrial areas, looking for these buildings that, that are interesting to us. And, um, and we just found the first, I don't know, uh, I think it was actually 30 uh, U UK customers and figured out how much are the wind turbines going to produce, how, much, uh, how many wind turbines to f fit on the buildings, and also using the same rationale as before, we had our knowledge of how many customers are likely to be interested in this, and also lastly, how many are likely to buy the product. So that's another figure. And you know what, I won't go too much into the last estimate. This one is about just using for, looking for references because we realized that uh, just as a general fact, high bay warehouses, really tall warehouses are interesting. So what you find on the producers of these warehouses and at their, west, uh, at their websites is that they actually have long reference lists of different uh, sites that they've, uh, they've put up. Uh, so you could, uh, each one of the buildings at these sites should actually be interesting for my technology. So that's another way of going about it. And finally, out of the blue came a market intelligence report. So I stopped doing uh, ridiculous market estimates and read the report instead. And uh, it seemed like it uh, landed on the sort of somewhat same uh, level as I'd uh, anticipated. Um, it's always very nice to have a market report telling you how big your market is, but at the same time, it doesn't really cover exactly what my turbine does and who it addresses, the segments I address. And uh, also, at the same time, it's kind of an indication of the market being a little bit more mature than I'd like to. This probably also means that someone else is reading this report and someone else is going into the market, which of course is something I don't want to uh, happen at, at this point. So, back to the non-alcoholic beer case. Um, <clears throat> this is an experiment, so I'll ha you'll have to bear with me. Um, I see a computer on pretty much every table here. So you saw how I did it. I just tried to find like an initial figure and, and uh, I tried to put up a method for qualifying that figure to and ending up at a final uh, estimate for how many turbines I can sell. So what I'd like you to do now is uh, do the same essentially. Uh, we had some of the segments for the non-alcoholic beer and I'd like you to pick one of the segments or you know, a new one and uh, essentially do a market estimate approach for it. So what you'll have is 10 minutes. You'll have five minutes for planning. How are we actually going to do this? Which resources are we going to use? Is it statistics? Is it user? Is it fora or whatever? Or, and after doing that, start looking into what can we actually find out within the next five minutes. And I know this is tough, but there's a reason for it. Of course, I don't expect you to end up at a, you know, a final result, but it's about learning from the process. And also, when you come up with new ideas for the rest of your studies. You need to do something like this. You need to be able to very quickly estimate, is this interesting? Is there a market for this? And how can I very quickly do a, you know, um, a quick feel on, is this interesting? And is, will I earn money on this? So that's what this is about. So let's say that uh, we start in uh, a few seconds now, and then you have until uh, 11, exactly. To, uh, to do this exercise. And you're welcome to leave the room as well. So please do that. Thanks. So uh, let's end it there. And uh, I'd love to hear what, uh, what people have been up to. Uh, so this uh, table down here, could you tell me what your approach was? Uh, we were searching for the driver segment. And uh, we found out that there is 4 million vehicles registered in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So we can assume that this is approximately the number of the drivers. And unfortunately, that's all we could, we could find. Sure. So how would you, uh, do you have any ideas as to how you could uh, qualify that any further? Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, my, my immediate idea is that, uh, okay, if we look at the drivers in particular, 
Uh, how many of these drivers actually want to dr drink beer as they're driving? It's hard to say, but you can actually get a minimum, at least uh, the way I see it, from looking at how many uh, people are caught drinking and driving each year. Maybe there's a statistic on that. Yeah, and that's we were searching for this, but we couldn't find a Okay, statistic. so that could be one way of, uh, one way of uh, qualifying it. Uh, so uh, someone else we haven't heard of uh, from for today. So the group up there, what did you do? Yes. <laughs> uh, we were looking at uh, people who are allergic uh, to alcohol, mm -hmm. and uh, we, didn't, we didn't really find some numbers, but we find something about that uh, 40 to 50 percent of uh, people in Asia are allergic to alcohol. So that's a big, big. That's a good starting point, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, what we got. Okay. Yeah. So f to get from there to uh, an actual market size. One would have to say, well, it is a market, first of all, isn't it? Uh, but uh, one would have to say, how can we qualify it with regards to the likelihood of these pink people actually drinking beer? And can we actually find within that group, I don't know, maybe uh, cultural, uh, you know, cultures who aspire to more uh, Western values or, you know, uh, beer, the beer drinking societies of the West or whatever. That could be one way of qualifying it. Uh, of course, that's very fluffy, isn't it? <laughs> but that's one way of uh, at least uh, trying to argue towards uh, the size of the market. So more inputs? Let's uh, hear you guys up here. Uh, we decided to think about pregnant women in Denmark. Yep. It's about uh, 60,000 uh, per year. OK. Yeah. Uh, and we, uh, Part of that would like to drink beer with alcohol is like maybe 60 to 70 percent. So we cut it down 40,000. Uh, that would probably like to continue to drink beer in the pregnancy. Uh, uh, we thought that one fourth of that would probably just go ahead and just start doing it, buying this type of beer. Mm -hmm. So we're down to 10,000. Uh, people that uh, would go to the market, to the store and buy this beer of this sex. 10,000 of 60,000. Okay. So, uh, well, yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's nice to see that you have several steps in there to, uh, to, uh, to reduce it and to qualify it. I think there's definitely some, you know, issues with, you know, being stigmatized as a pregnant, pregnant woman drinking a beer. You know, it's uh, I don't know how many of them would actually do it, but despite it being an alcoholic beer. You know, the fact just we had the point earlier of, uh, you know, having the same bottles. So it looks like a beer. It, it walks like a beer. It talks like a beer. But it's a non-alcoholic beer. You know, so uh, I don't know if 70% in that case is uh, you know <laughs> a realistic number. No, but no, it's no. definitely. But what that's it does. The first step. Yeah. That's, uh, just they, they drink beer before they get pregnant. Ah, so okay, sorry, yes, I didn't get that part. It was actually, it's just uh, maybe 25%. Okay, perfect. Well, yeah, that's, that's great. That's a very good approach. And, and what you would need to, uh, to do then is to find a basis for, you know, each of these uh, assumptions and these qualifications. So, okay, let's take one more group before we uh, continue. So, anyone wants to volunteer their estimate? Yeah. Yeah, we uh, wanted to look into uh, the construction workers. Mm -hmm. We found from uh, Danish Statistical Institute, I think it's called, mm -hmm. um, there's some uh, employment numbers, and we found that there's 165,000 people employed in that sector in Denmark. And um, then we wanted to look into how much they would actually drink at work. Uh, first, we found a number that the average Danish people uh, drink uh, 90 liters a year, but that's in their whole free time, so that number might not work mm -hmm. uh, that well for us. Then we uh, maybe try to assume that a worker would, could uh, drink two bottles of this beer each day at work, and that gave us a number of I don't know, 60 million mm -hmm. bottles a year. <laughs> Yeah. Cool. Thanks a lot for that. So uh, I, I hope this goes to show that you can do this in a lot of different ways. I think a lot of the, the estimates here started with statistics, but the, you know, going from there, you did a lot of different things. Um, 
what you need to do is think about this for your own uh, for your own product. Actually, this is uh, probably one of the most important tasks you have ahead of you uh, because you need to have specific strategies for how to do this for your own product. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And then, of course, a, 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 one good, a good way of doing that is something that I haven't touched upon, which is, I realize now, not very, uh, very smart. But uh, uh, what I'd do in a case like that is, for instance, do uh, field studies. You know, try to make available a case of beer to, uh, you know, uh, a shed of uh, workers working on a construction site, see how many are left at the end of the day, and try to quantify things by, by doing something like that. So you can actually do, you could also do a survey, of course, but uh, the other thing would be a much more, you know, a valid result, but uh, a survey could be done, things like that. So you can definitely be active in qualifying your, your markets. Can I, um, um, yeah. can I make an addition there? I think um, things like non-alcoholic beer are probably a classic case of where the person or people buying it aren't the people consuming it. So for construction workers, you'll probably be selling to the head of the construction firm and convincing them that this is a good thing to buy for your workers and the construction, head of the construction firm will think, yeah, that's a good idea because they can still drink beer and they'll be equally as productive in the afternoons and so on. Um, and it's, it's very important to consider who you're selling to compared to who's using it. And just to take a case in point from your projects, this team here is producing a, a wind speed reader. And I was saying to them the other day, it's a very different product and a very different market size if you're targeting the users. If they're selling it to golf shops, um, it's very different to if they're selling it in Magazan. Oh, how is, how is it pronounced, sorry? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the big department store in, uh, in Denmark. Um, because when it's sold there, it's probably going to be the mothers of the users or family relatives buying it as Christmas presents. And the market size is quite different to if you're directly selling to the user. Um, so for the construction industry, you might want to uh, interview bosses of construction firms and say, would you place an order for this? How many, how many workers do you have working underneath you? How much uh, beer is consumed per day? Do you provide um, refreshments for your workforce? So that might be a way of uh, um, identifying your market size. There's a guy at the back there. Yeah, you're doing a position, yeah, but yeah. we were thinking of uh, using it for, for training purposes. Okay. I, I think you're right, but I don't want to muddy the, uh, the message, <laughs> which is uh, market size, not golf. But uh, <laughs> rest assured, the group has, uh, has, uh, is aware of that and they've, uh, they've adapted their concept to it, <laughs> I have no doubt. So, uh, uh, so remember this, look into this, this is hugely important, this is where your arguments essentially uh, start. Um, just to finish off here, of course, it's uh, absolutely ridiculous to talk about market sizes if you don't talk about the costs uh, of the product, because it doesn't matter if you have like a, a huge uh, market for something and you can't really earn a buck on it. So, uh, so of course, you'll, um, you'll have to bring that in as well. And at this early stage, when you don't necessarily know what your product is going to cost, it's enough to say, okay, what do similar products cost? Products of similar complexity, of similar size, or to, to, the, to similar customers. Um, and uh, also, just as a note as to, to what Tom just said, selling in one place and selling in another place is two completely different things. So you can have two completely different prices. As I've said, said earlier, and I want to reiter reiterate that, sell at the highest possible price. And then you always also, so, so that'll maybe enable you to get a lot out of a market that doesn't necessarily looks that big on numbers or sort of number of sales, but because of the profit you can gain, it's, it's a big market. So that's actually a lot 
of words said and a very long lecture, so uh, I appreciate you keeping the attention for so long. I think we'll take a 15 minute break now until, what is that, five to 25 past, and then I'll do the final lecture on forecasting, and I'll make it as quick as possible. So thanks for that. <laughs>